Good evening. It is an act of aggression condemned as a barbaric attack on an independent democratic country. Cities have been bombarded, towns devastated, and countless lives have been lost. And now, growing evidence of war crimes is emerging. Evidence dismissed by Russia as a sham. Tonight, in his first British broadcast interview since the war began, I speak to the man who does much of the talking for Vladimir Putin, his spokesman, Dmitry Peskov. He joins me live from his office in Moscow. And thank you very much for being with us. First of all, um, do you accept that the first weeks of this invasion have not gone according to plan for President Putin? Well, first of all, I would rather disagree with your qualification of what is going on. You didn't mention uh, the, the, the qualification of special military operation. And you didn't say a word about the reasons for the special and military operation. Uh, you, because it's a war, isn't it? It's not a special military operation. It is a full-scale, illegal war. It's a very serious operation uh, with... with the, uh, quite heavy consequences. Yes, uh, I would. I would like to start to start with the reason of this operation. Actually, it's very important to, to remind you. Uh, 2014. This is the year when the legal history of uh, Ukraine was changed during uh, an illegal coup, and after that, Ukraine has started to become uh, an anti-Russian center. Everything that that occurred in Ukraine was aimed against our country. And uh, during the last couple of decades, actually, we were concerned about our security. NATO, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, started to move towards our body, uh, our boundaries. Yeah. And we were, we were really nervous about that. But, and but Ukraine, before... but Ukraine, let's be honest about this. Ukraine posed yes. no threat to Russia, and NATO is a defensive organisation that also poses no threat to Russia. And just my point at the beginning was that you have retreated. The reason I said it's not going to plan is you've retreated from the capital. President Zelensky is still in power. You've lost thousands of troops. You've lost six generals, uh, hundreds of tanks and other equipment. It's, it's a humiliation, really, isn't it? No, no. It's a wrong understanding of what is going on. But what, what is uh, wrong about what I've just said? Well, nearly everything. Nearly everything. Well, but you've uh, lost okay, thousands uh, of troops. Yeah, let's go through it. You've lost thousands of troops. How many troops yes, have you lost? We have, we have, we have significant losses of troops, and uh, it's 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 a huge tragedy for us. Uh, now, about two regions, Kiev and the Chernigov regions. Uh, so actually, the troops were really withdrawn from that region as an act of a goodwill during the negotiations between two delegations, Russian and Ukrainian delegation. And it, wanted, it was an act of a goodwill just to, uh, uh, to uh, well, to, to, to lift tension from those regions and in order to show that Russia is really ready to create comfortable conditions for continuation of negotiations. Yeah, but it's just not true, is it? Because you continued... If it was, if it was a, a measure of goodwill, why then did you continue to bombard Mariupol in the way that you have to devastate that city? If you really wanted to facilitate peace talks, you would have had a ceasefire. But you carried on bombarding Mariupol and shelling Kharkiv and other places. So it's, it's not really true, is it? If you let me, I'll try to explain. Well, first of all, Mariupol is a part of Lugansk People's Republic. You know, we recognize them as an independent state. And actually, the premier goal of the operation was to, uh, was to, 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 to assist those people of two people's republics that were suffering for eight years from heavy shelling from Ukrainian military people. And by the way, during those eight years, no one would... Uh, would uh, mention that, uh, would mention those atrocities. But no, no one way in that Europe justifi no one in Great Britain... Even if it was true, that doesn't justify a full-scale evasion, invasion, does it? I mean, let's keep this in proportion. I mean, it, it, are you determined... Let you, you mentioned Mariupol is part of... It's part of Ukraine. 
Are you determined to take Mariupol, whatever the human cost, whatever the cost in civilian life? Mariupol is going to be uh, liberated from uh, nationalistic battalions. And uh, we hope it will happen sooner than later. So in liberation, the you describe it as liberation. So the pounding of Mariupol, the pounding of civilian buildings, the pounding of a hospital, that's liberation, is it? Well, hospital, hospital was a fake. Hospital was a fake. And uh, uh, we have very serious reasons to believe that it was a fake. And we insist on that. This is number one. Number two. Well, Unfortunately, let me just say, you, you did say that one of the, 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 the famous photograph or infamous photograph of a woman on a stretcher, which you said was an, she, you said she was an actor. She turned out, a doctor told us later yeah, to have died. Stayed. She yeah. told us to have, she died. So let's not talk about that. I mean, how many civilians, let me ask you this, how many civilians do you think have died in Ukraine so far? I don't want to operate any figures that are not confirmed or double confirmed. Uh, we, have, we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful in pronouncing any figures because we're living in a, uh, during a days of, of fakes, fakes and lies. Well, let, that let, we, let me tell you this. That let, we meet every day. Let me tell you this. So your UN, UN ambassador has said there are no credible reports of civilian casualties. And as regards Butcher, According to the, your Ministry of Defence on April the 3rd, and I quote, not a single local resident has suffered from any violent action while Russia was in control. I mean, do you really expect the world to believe that? We insist on that. We insist on that and we insist that the whole situation, the situation is butcher, is a well-staged uh, insinuation, nothing else. So let me just show you. And uh, those poor people, those let poor people, and we're seeing dead bodies there. Yeah. And those dead bodies there were not victim of Russian military personnel. You see, this is astonishing for you to talk like this. Let me just show you this satellite image from uh, Bucha on the outskirts of Kiev. And this is an image taken on the 28th of February. Uh, we have geolocated it to Yavalanska Street in Bucha before Russia had control of the area. It's a normal looking street. Let's compare it to an image of the exact same location on the 19th of March, just a couple of days after Russia had taken control of the area. And now you see the shadows, bodies strewn uh, along the street. And we know they are bodies yeah, we know, from we know this those video. Well, we well, know we, those Maxar's no, pictures. No, but we know they are bodies from this video released, I'm showing now, on social media on the 1st of April, which we have geolocated as well. We have blurred the bodies yeah. for viewers. And you can see this body is in the same place as the one seen in the satellite image. The body hasn't moved. The car drives along further, you can see, stops at two more bodies, again matching the position of the ones in that satellite image and so it continues with everybody on the street and you maintain that all this was staged you're talking about a fake this shows that dead yeah. bodies appeared while you control the area russian troops killed those people didn't they if you have another 20 or to 30 minutes i will explain step by step why it all fakes if you have this additional time, let's go on, I will tell you. Yeah, well, you, you you're saying uh, it's fake, so there's not much point going on, but we've verified it, we've geolocated it, we've got the dates yes. from the satellite well, imagery we know, company. We know, pretty well, we know pretty well the company that, uh, that has supplied international community with these satellite pictures. This is a Maxar company that is in a, in, a, in a very tight cooperation with Pentagon, with the Pentagon. And uh, yeah, it's interesting, it's interesting to know, and what you would probably be uh, uh, interesting to know, that uh, they don't have actually exact dates on their, on their uh, footage, on their satellite images. So it's, it's impossible to, to allocate a, an exact date of uh, those satellite pictures. OK, let's have a and look at this. Insist, okay. We still insist that those pictures were made after Russian troops were withdrawn from that area. 
OK, well, what about this one then? Because our team has also verified this next video to early March in the same area of Butcher. And here we see a woman with a bike named today as Arena Filkina walking along uh, Yabolanska Street when Russian troops were in control. Around the corner is an armoured vehicle identified by our team as a Russian military vehicle. So the Russians are there. You can see the vehicle fire, a shot which creates a plume of smoke exactly where Irina was standing with her bike. Now, I after can't, the... Can't, can't after, let me finish... So if I could just finish, yeah. Ms. Perth, sorry. After the Russians yeah. had withdrawn, yeah, sure. this video, geolocated to the exact same spot, showed Irina lying dead on the ground. So there can be no real doubt, surely, that this uh, shows Russian troops killing a civilian. Yeah. It, it's right there on film. I'd appreciate on, if on you film. could be more specific. I'd appreciate if you could be more specific. How could you exactly identify the Russian tank or whatever? What was standing? Yeah. Why, why do you think it was Russian? OK, well, I think we... We got a still that shows the Russian tower. You can see, if you look at that, you can see the V marking clearly on the side. Yeah, but those which, are not the tanks that, that, that were shooting. That suggests... It's that, a different that, position. They are, they are the exact same uh, armoured vehicles that were on that street. I mean, look, we've, we've no, verified what it. We've what you're geolocated. showing right now, what you're showing right now are not the exact tank that was shooting. Let's you have to be very careful. You have to be very so, careful in what you are showing, just not to it repeat It is exactly face. the same armoured vehicle. I mean, so you deny that that happened. You're denying it's happened and you're saying it's being faked, basically, it's some sort of conspiracy. Is that right? We deny that Russian military uh, can have something in common with these atrocities and with dead bodies that were shown on the streets of Bucha. So let's just be clear here. What you're saying to the world, what you're saying to Ukrainians, what you're saying to, let's face it, the relatives of those victims that we've just seen there, and what you're saying to Russians, your own people, is that this is fabricated, it is fake, and that it's some sort of huge conspiracy, a propaganda stunt. I mean, do you, do you realise how grotesque that sounds? Well, it's not a conspiracy, actually. It's a bold fake. It's a bold fake, and we've been speaking about that for a couple of days, but no one would listen to us. We've been presenting very detailed explanations on very various internet resources. If you're interested in that, we'll provide you with those internet resources. But, but to say it's a fake, it, you're suggesting it's a conspiracy between satellite imagery companies, between Ukrainians, between all the Western media. I mean, you're, you're suggesting it is a conspiracy. It's exactly what you're saying. Well, of course, it can, it can be a play of fakes. It can be a play of lies. Okay. You can attach any any date to a picture uh, that was made through satellite. Okay. And well, then, what about? Well, we have to, we have to doubt sometimes. I mean, you cannot be without any investigation. So, but you doubt all the you time. You cannot be I mean, so sure. Okay. About blaming and everything on Russia. Well, let me put this to you then. Human Rights Watch, uh, the organisation, they've already documented uh, documented hundreds of apparent war crimes. And these include, I've got it here, repeated rape of a woman in front of her child after her husband was killed, other cases of rape, two cases of summary execution, one of six men, uh, the other of one man, other cases of torture, unlawful violence, threats against civilians. I've got the dates, I've got the uh, witness statements, we can go through it if you want. But these are documented killings with witness evidence and corroborated, by the way, today by Amnesty International. And we've, and we've yet to discover what's happening in Mariupol. Do, I mean, don't you see it's just preposterous to sort of issue a blanket denial of all these things? It should all be very thoroughly uh, investigated. I agree with you. But at the same time, uh, we have uh, even the bigger amount of, uh, uh, of uh, eyewitnesses and people who took part in the, these various situations and 
in Mariupol, in in Bucha, and other uh, other towns uh, of Ukraine, that were uh, uh, that were telling us the terrible stories of uh, those nationalistic battalion uh, battalion military military people torturing people, not letting them leave the town, not letting them uh, uh, go out of the town, flee the town. So we, we, we also have these uh, eyewitnesses. So, I mean... But, you, do, but you, don't, you don't want to listen to them, no, to those we eyewitnesses. Do. We do. We've just been carrying a story this afternoon about claims of uh, Ukrainian uh, war. I spoke to the chief prosecutor of Ukraine on this program the other day, and she said that all, all war crimes would be investigated and all the evidence would be passed on to the International Criminal Court. The course, difference, the difference are, is one... We are interested. The, we are the interested in investigating everything. But the difference and we, is... We also, collect, we also collect evidence and proofs for crimes that were committed by nationalistic battalions. But the difference is one of scale, but it is also that they are agreeing to investigate. You are saying it is not true, it is a fake, before you've even investigated. Well, we have to say that it's not true because we're hearing that everything is blamed on Russia. And we, 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 we completely disagree with that. And by the way, I would have a suggest, a humble suggest to you, a uh, suggestion. If you make a story about crimes in Ukraine, and if you speak to Ukrainian prosecutor general, why don't you speak to Russian prosecutor general to, to make an objective picture, to present two sides? We'd love to do that. Points. Okay, okay, we will do that. Let's just suppose then that you are, you know, what you are saying is right and that you have not, your troops have not committed these crimes. Will you, presumably then, you will happily cooperate with the International Criminal Court. If you're not guilty of any of these things, presumably you will cooperate with the International Criminal Court. Even we're if you don't recognize that. Court. We do not support and we do not recognize International Criminal Court, and we're not the, the only country in the world who are doing that. So uh, this is number one. And we are interested in uh, really independent and then the objective investigation of all the crimes. But we want just to. to we, we want to understand what could be the format of such an investigation, because we, we have a bitter experience of international investigations, like with the, uh, with the grounded Korean aircraft, uh, international investigation, and we, were not, and we were not let into that investigation. So we cannot consider it to be objective. So, but, so I and mean, there, are other, there are other special bitter, tribunals. Uh, bitter, there are other special tribunals that you could cooperate with. My, my only point is that if you haven't done this, then why don't you just cooperate with the tribunals or the International Criminal Court? Well, we're not speaking any tribunals. We don't know about the existence of tribunals. And I repeat, we do not recognize International Court. Let me, let me put this to you. You deny responsibility then quite clearly. What you can't deny is that civilians, many civilians, including women and children, have died as a result of this onslaught. And they would be alive today had you not invaded Ukraine. I think it's 142 children so far. You, you yourself have children. You have a young daughter. When you see the images, how, how does it make you feel? How do you sleep at night? It's not about my sleep at night, actually. And this is about this is about Ukrainian military and Ukra Ukrainian nationalistic uh, military personnel trying to use civil civil people as a shield, as a civil civil shield. So they are covering themselves with civil people and not letting them flee the town or flee the flee the city. And from the very beginning, Russian military uh, were never shelling civil ob objects. They were just aiming and using high-precision uh, missiles um, uh, to, to, uh, to attack 
military infrastructure of Ukraine because well, there the must have been, well, there been, there must have been a lot of, of well sir forgive me for interrupting but there must have been a lot of Ukrainian military and a lot of civilian buildings then because our reporters have been out and about in many of these towns exactly, and cities exactly and, this is the and, point no, the, I mean, it is defies belief that many of the targets that we've seen destroyed are military uh, targets. But I was talking to you really, not as a Kremlin spokesman, I was talking to you, you know, as a father, as a human being. What, when you see these images, how do you sleep at night? That, that is, it was, that was really my question. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy and... Uh... Uh, our military are doing their best to, to bring an end to that operation. And we do hope that in coming days, in in, in, in foreseeable future, this operation will reach its goals or will finish it by the negotiations between Russian and Ukrainian delegation. I mean, do you think this can possibly end in a negotiation or talks after what has happened? It can. It can. It will strongly depend on the um, uh, so on con consistency of Ukrainian position, and to what extent they will be ready to they will be ready to meet uh, to meet our conditions. Boris Johnson has said that Russia's and I quote: "This is a quote. Russia's despicable attacks on innocent civilians in Irpin and Butcher are yet more evidence that Putin and his army are committing war crimes in Ukraine." We will not rest until justice is served. What, what's your message to Boris Johnson? Well, uh, he's very loud in his rhetorics about Russia from the very beginning of the operation. So uh, in our understanding, he's, he's rather not constructive in his attitude. Uh, we have never heard any, any uh, similar rhetorics coming from Boris Johnson during the last eight years, when people in Donbas were killed by Ukrainian nationalists, when they were heavily bombarded and shelled by heavy artillery. We have never heard a word coming from but Mr. Johnson. But it is scarcely comparable. Does, does, in light of what Mr. Johnson has said, does Mr. Putin worry about ending up in a war crimes court? No, he's not. Have you talked to him about that? Does he realize that it's a possibility? Well, uh, we don't see any possibility for that. But you have spoken about it, have you? We've read uh, lots of reports coming from various countries, uh, politologists and, and uh, so-called specialists in Russia d discussing such a possibility, but we don't consider it this this possibility to be to be realistic you see one of the problems with these blanket denials is that isn't the problem for you and for mr putin that very few people outside russia believe a a single word that you say about all this uh why do you think it's 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 a few people it's a great amount of people it's a great amount of people who understands who understand concerns of Russia and who have been understanding those concerns during the last couple of de decades. And the world, you have to understand that the world is bigger than Europe and the United States and Great Britain. It's much bigger. Is it? But, wait, so, but I mean, in the last hour, you've just been kicked off the UN Human Rights Council. So that is what much of the world thinks about, about Russia and about the alleged war crimes coming out now. We're sorry about that, and we'll continue to defend our interests using every uh, possible legal means. We'll continue to defend our interests and to explain ourselves. The problem with the, 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 the lies that many international leaders are accusing you of is it's not new, is it? I mean, look, you can look just recently at the lies from... Russia, just the recent ones, the Ukrainians, you say, shot down Malaysian Airlines MH17 in 2014. The Syrian opposition gassed their own people. The white helmets in Syria are terrorists who belong to Al-Qaeda. Navalny, Putin's opponent, collapsed because of his medication, not because he was uh, poisoned. The GRU agents who were in Salisbury came to see a cathedral. Um, 
In 2014, again, there are no Russian troops in Crimea or in Donbass. And then just a few weeks ago, we are not going to invade Ukraine. I mean, none of those, none of those are true, are they? None of those are true. Which one of those is step true? By step. Which one of those is true? Let's start from the very beginning. What was number one? Uh, Ukrainians, uh, you say the Ukrainians shot down Malaysian Airlines MH17 in 2014. I mean, you're not going to tell me that that's true. Well, there are lots of there are lots of evidence. There are lots of technical calculations, and they were all submitted to the court in the Hague. Uh, there is a huge deficit deficit of, uh, of of proofs and technical data in the. Uh, in the court, and there are uh, different points of view. And the GIE agents uh, in Salisbury came to see the cathedral. I mean, look, the problem here is a problem of trust, that people don't trust what you say. No, when you, you have, have, when you have, have a major... Oh, Mr. Them, Pesco, let me finish. You when you have a major country, but you are a major country, hugely important culturally, hugely important historically, and people now don't believe a word the leadership says. That is a problem, isn't it? Which people? Many of the international leaders. Of most of the West, many of the international leaders. Many of them, yes. They say that they don't believe. But many of the leaders believe and they tend to, they tend to, to explore, they tend to listen to our point of view, and we find their position much more constructive and much more attractive for us. But it's a problem in any dialogue, any future negotiations, that people don't trust you, particularly over NATO. I mean, Vladimir Putin embarked on this military operation, basically saying it was to counter, partly, partly to counter the expansion of NATO in Eastern Europe. Well, NATO has more troops now in Eastern Europe. Germany is increasing its defence spending. I mean, NATO is stronger now than it was. It's stronger, not weaker. Yeah, and thus we, we have to rebalance the situation and we, tell, we have to take additional measures to ensure our own security because we still, we are deeply convinced that NATO, NATO is, a, is a machine for confrontation. It's not a peaceful alliance. It was tailored for confrontation. And the main purposes of its existence to confront and to confront our country. But this see, is a very unfortunate situation, but we have to take it into account. But you see, NATO is a defensive organisation, and Finland, yes, exactly. Finland and Sweden, uh, Finland has an 800-mile border with your country. They now want to join NATO as a result of all this. What would, what would Russia do if, if Finland and Sweden joined NATO? We'll have to we'll have to rebalance the situation. I repeat again, and then we'll have to uh, we'll have to 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 um, to make our western western flank uh, more more sophisticated in, in terms of ensuring our security. But when you say rebalance, I mean President Putin has warned of serious military and political consequences. What I just wonder what that means. Well, we'll have to, you know, it's everything about mutual deterring, mutual deterring. And should one side, should one side, and we consider NATO to be one side, um, should one side be more powerful than the other, especially in terms of, of nuclear uh, arms, then it will constitute a threat for the whole architecture of security. And uh, it, it will take us to take additional measures, um, additional measures to th strengthen uh, our potential. But, but would you, just very quickly on that, uh, finally, would you consider that an existential threat? Because that is, you have said it would take an existential threat to use nuclear weapons, which you've just mentioned. Uh, what exactly? Another, another enlargement of NATO? You would consider that an existential threat? No, I don't think so. Right. Would you consider pressure on your economy or, you know, uh, sanctions that you deemed were to, to wreck your economy, topple, even topple the regime, would you consider that an existential threat? 
Well, no, no. We've been living under uh, under sanctions for for a couple of decades, and we, we we actually we actually we have got accustomed to that situation. And uh, uh, well, we we we've started to prepare ourselves for this sanctions uh, a year ago, a year ago. And so now, of course, we are in a very tight situation in terms of economy, but our economy is still on its feet. And we are uh, quite, quite well, uh, we're, we're safe, maybe not safe and sound, but we're safe in terms of economy, in terms of macro stability. Just finally. And we're trying to, and we even, we're trying to take advantage out of this situation uh, giving a boost to to development of our productive sector of our uh, national technologies and so on and so forth. And just finally, um, you've acc accused Ukraine of being a fascist uh, regime, but isn't it Russia that is an increasingly looking like a, a fascist state? All the hallmarks of fascism, the shutting down of all opposition, the strict censorship of the media, the sinister Z sign that is um, appearing, and just the climate of fear. Doesn't that all have a feeling of, of fascism about it? No, well, I consider it quite unacceptable to, to, to speak about uh, in that way about my country. Uh, no, the answer is definitely no. The answer is no. And uh, uh, asking this question, I would suggest that you just recall last last uh, eight years with Nazis demonstrations on the streets of Kiev, on the streets of Lvov, with people uh, who were parts of Nazis uh, regiments during the Second World War, carrying Nazi Nazi signs and Nazi flags, and uh, performing Nazi. Nazi, Nazi, Nazi. Uh, what the, I don't know the, the, the English word for that. Nazi. But, yeah, but, yeah, but, they, yeah, but that, those Nazi demonstrations, they, well, it was a reality. It was a reality on the streets of Ukrainian but, cities. But, but, the, but the, the, the last election, the Nazi, the far right parties barely won 2% of the vote. I mean, you've got to keep this in proportion. Look, my final question is this what is to come? Because only Vladimir Putin knows that. Uh, presumably more bombardments, presumably more death, who knows, maybe more um, war crimes. My final question is this. You know, you've ripped away the future of two countries, immediate future for two countries, Russia, your own country, and Ukraine. And my final question is, is it all worth it? Honestly, is it all worth it? The whole story is about future is about guaranteeing our future. Just imagine a situation when a, a member of NATO, Ukraine, thinking about returning of Crimea, attacks Russia and attacks Russian Crimea, and using an article number five of NATO charter, NATO countries possessing nukes will have to defend Ukraine. Yeah. It should be a third world but war. And what is being done but it is to save happen. us from any potential threat of such a war. But it was never going to happen, was it, like that? But listen, Mr Peskov, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much.